Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us today for Celebration Church Online. And if you have your Bible or Bible app, I would encourage you to turn with me to the Old Testament book of Ruth and the first chapter. I want to remind you that you can actually find that scripture passage at webcc.info where you can find the study guide as well. So you might want to turn there or download that as well. Today we're continuing our series, Facing New Challenges, and we're learning about overcoming grief and loss in our lives. Now last week we began this series in the book of Ruth. Ruth is the eighth book of the Bible. It follows the books of Joshua and Judges. It's a, and Ruth is only four chapters. The book of Ruth is only four chapters. But those four chapters take us on a roller coaster of a journey that's the equivalent of any Hollywood drama that you can see at any time. Last week in the first seven verses of Ruth 1, we learned about Ruth's family, about how a man by the name of Elimelech took his wife Naomi and, he, and his sons, Malin and Kilian, and he moved to the uh, city, and he moved to the country of Moab. Now they moved from Bethlehem, which meant house of bread or house of provision, to Moab, which meant God's wash pot or God's garbage can, and all kinds of things went awry in their lives. Then Elimelech died. And later on, his sons Malin and Killian died, and leaving Naomi along with her daughters-in-law. And so she and they decided to move to Bethlehem. And that's where we pick up in today's scripture passage, Ruth chapter 1, beginning with verse 8. The Bible says, But on the way to Bethlehem, Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back to your mother's homes, and may the Lord reward you for your kindness to your husbands and to me. May the Lord bless you with the security of another marriage. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they all broke down and wept. No, they said, we want to go with you to your people. But Naomi replied, why should you go on with me? Can I still give birth to other sons who could be your husbands? No, my daughters, return, return to your parents' homes, for I am too old to marry again. And even if it were possible, and I were to get married tonight and bear sons, then what? Would you wait for them to grow up and refuse to marry someone else? No, of course not, my daughters. Things are far more bitter for me than for you because the Lord himself has raised his fist against me. What an interesting quote from Naomi. And again, they wept together and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung tightly to Naomi. Look, Naomi said to her, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. You should do the same. But Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and turn back wherever you go. I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. Man, what commitment Ruth had to her mother-in-law. And when they always saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. So the two of them continued on their journey. As I begin this message, I want to ask you the question, what are some of the dreams that you've had for your life? I was thinking about how little children sometimes have big dreams and sometimes they have not so big dreams. Somebody asked a little boy what his dreams were. He said, my dreams are to find a girlfriend, kiss a girlfriend, and then rule the world. That was his big dream right there. <laughs> Uh, another boy said, my dream, uh, he said, my dream is to study herpetology, uh, become successful in herpetology, which is a study of na snakes and lizards, and then have a wife and children and then breed dragons. I mean, what a big dream he had right there. And then some kids have not so big dreams. One little girl was asked what her dream was. She said, my dream is to go to work at Taco Bell along with my mama. Now, there's nothing wrong with working at Taco Bell, but we would all hope our children have bigger dreams than that. What are some of the dreams you've had for your life? Have you had the dream of landing the right job, uh, having a successful career, maybe even starting your own business? Have you had the dream of finding a mate and, and getting married and having children? Or have you had the dream of becoming financially successful and, 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 and traveling the world? Or, or have you had more altruistic dreams? Have you had the dream of helping children or, or helping the elderly or some other disadvantaged group in society today uh, in our nation and world? I, I'm asking you about your dreams because everybody needs to have some kind of dream for their lives. You see, dreams are what, dreams are what compel us to be the very best we can be and dreams are what propel us to go out and be difference makers in the world around us. We need to have a dream. But while most people have dreams as they begin their adult life, oftentimes they lose those dreams or their dreams are demolished by the difficulties they, they experience in their life. You see, we start off life with all kinds of hopes and dreams, but often those dreams are circumvented by the losses we experience in our lives. And, and we've all experienced some kind of loss at some time or another in our lives. 
Maybe we've lost friends because someone moves away or because we have a fallen out with someone. Maybe, maybe we've lost jobs because our position was eliminated because we had troubles with our boss. Uh, maybe we lost our health because uh, we contracted an illness or suffered through an injury. Uh, people lose their innocence because they're abused or mistreated or, or, or in some kind of way. Uh, some people lose their integrity because they begin to compromise in some way in their lives. And, then, and lots of people have lost money at some time in their life. They've made bad decisions or bad investments or they bought things they didn't need with money they didn't have to impress people they didn't even like. I mean, we've all experienced those kind of losses in life. And then sometimes we lose family members or friends to death or divorce or some tragic life. Have you experienced any of those kinds of losses in your life? Well, if you have... Uh, if you have, you can identify with the story of Naomi and Orpah and Ruth and the losses they experienced in life. And if you haven't, you will at some time in your life. Because So this message is not only helpful for those who have experienced losses in life, but it's also preventative for, the, for everyone will someday experience some kind of significant loss in life. Now, a lot of people, because they experience so many losses in life, wind up living defeated and discouraged lives. And here's what you need to understand when you experience life, when you experience losses in life. To begin with, you need to understand that life is not fair. Everybody's got to understand life is not fair, and we don't always get what we deserve in life. We have this belief that all the bad things happen to us because of bad choices we make. And the good things happen to us because of the good things that we do. Uh, but those things aren't true. When good things happen to you in life, you know what that's called? That's called grace. When bad things happen in your life, that's called life. This is not heaven. We don't live in a perfect world. Things don't always go as planned. There, there is no happy, there's not always a happy ending to everything. Ecclesiastes 8.14 says, Sometimes something useless happens on earth. Bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people. You've got to understand life is not fair. Here's the second thing you've got to understand is that God's will is not always done in our world and in people's lives. You know, when something tragic happens, somebody who's real pious will come along and say, well, you know, you have to suck it up because that was just God's will. It's just God's will. But that's not true. It's never God's will for innocent people to be hurt or harmed. It's never God's will for families to be separated. It's never God's will for people to go through any kind of abuse in their lives. The Bible says God is not the author of evil. In fact, the Bible says that it's the devil who's a thief who comes to steal and kill and destroy. So don't blame God for all the bad things that happen in your life or in our world. Now, could God stop the terrorists and the criminals and, and all those kind of people? Yes, He could, but He would have to take away their will. If He had to take away their will, He'd have to take away your will and my will. And God is not willing to force His will on any of us. But we can't blame God for all the tragedies and difficulties and the hurts that we experience in our lives. It's amazing to me. We want to take credit for the good things that happen to us. We want to blame God for the bad things that happen to us. But the, most of the things that happen are not God's will for our lives. Naomi and her daughters, law as we see in our story, they experienced much loss and grief. Naomi even blamed it on God for a little while. And their losses had changed their life circumstances in negative ways. Now, you know, you and I know that losing loved ones to death or to a tragic life or to something else can drive people to despair and sometimes even to destruction in their lives. Or, or those things can drive us to the Lord. They can, they can either make us bitter or they can make us better in our lives. Let me tell you, in times of difficulty, in times of loss, in times of sorrow, that's when we need to deepen our relationship with the Lord. Here's what the psalmist said in Psalm 46, verse 1. He said that God is our refuge and our strength, and He's always ready to help in times of trouble. And that reminds us that our God is the wonderful counselor. He is the mighty God. He is the everlasting Father. He's the Prince of Peace. And in times of trouble, not all the time, but especially in times of sorrow and grief and loss, that's when, we need to, that's when we need to press into the Lord because He's the one who can help us walk through those valleys and difficulties and challenges in our lives. Amen. The Bible tells us that the Lord... He wants to enable us to survive grief and loss. And so we can go on to live positive and, and productive and fulfilling lives. So there, there are five things I want you to take note of. Five things that, you, that will help you deal with the losses and grief you have suffered or you will suffer in your life. Here's what they are. First of all, surviving grief and loss requires acknowledging loss in our lives. Acknowledging loss in our lives. Let's go back to our story in Ruth 1. The Bible says Elimelech died and Naomi was left with her two sons. Uh, but two, ten years later, both Malin and Killian had died. And this left Naomi alone without her sons or her husband. And in the verses that follow, we find Naomi acknowledging the grief she experienced as a result of the deaths of her husband and her sons. Let me tell you, acknowledging our losses 
is an important step in overcoming or surviving grief and loss in our lives. I say that because many people have experienced great losses. They struggle with what, uh, what psychologists call denial, not acknowledging in any way or to anyone they've experienced uh, the great losses they've experienced in their life. See, grief is a part of life, but the problem is most people don't know how to grieve or they refuse to grieve. I shared, I've shared with our congregation that my mother was actually raised by an uncle and aunt that couldn't have children. And when, uh, when I was born, uh, for the first five years of my life, my aunt who raised my mother, she was the one who took care of me when I was a little one. And then she died when I was five years of age. And I was so close to her and I was so torn up by her death. I couldn't understand why God would take my aunt from me. I remember at her funeral service, I was crying. As I walked out of the church service, it seemed to me that, that all the men of my family were looking at me and saying, boy, men don't cry. So at five years of age, I made a vow. I would never cry again for the rest of my life. I would never cry again. Now, I, I did cry at times. I would fake cry when my parents were paddling me. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I would fake cry so they would stop paddling me. But I, listen, no matter what happened to me, no matter what I suffered, no matter what I experienced, I wouldn't cry. It wasn't until I came to the Lord at 19 years of age that I found how to grieve and to cry again in my life. There are a lot of people who are like me from age 5 to age 19. They, they've just stuffed their grief. They haven't dealt with their grief. They haven't dealt with their issues. They're, they're acting like everything is okay. But the truth is they are in denial. And one day, that grief and sorrow is going to hit them with the force of a hurricane. Here's what we know from, from the Bible and from psychologists. When, when dealing with grief and loss, we need to take time to express our grief. Back in May, we were studying the story of David and his men who were, uh, who were uh, their camp was attacked by the Amalekites. Remember, David and his men were off uh, running around with the Philistines, which reminds us when you're running with the wrong crowd, troubles are always going to occur in people's lives. And the Bible says the Amalekites came along and they took away uh, their wives and their children. And the Bible says when David and his men saw the ruins and realized what had happened to their families, they wept until they could weep no more. Have you ever had that experience in your life where you wept until you could weep no more? If you have it, you need to have that kind of experience, especially when you lose someone to death or divorce or some kind of tragedy in life. It's helpful in healing to be able to express our grief and sorrow when we experience significant losses in life. Some people don't do that. They're stuffers. They push it down. They pretend it's not there. That's why 30 years later, they're still struggling with emotional stress in their life from losses they experienced 20 or 30 years earlier involving their parents, their former partner, or some friend that betrayed them or something else in their life. You see, the Bible says God doesn't want us to suppress our pain. He wants us to confess it to Him and then express it to the friends that we can trust in our lives. Because if we don't let it out, we're going to act it out in some kind of unhealthy way in our lives. Some of you were hurt years ago growing up. Maybe your parents divorced or maybe they abused you. Maybe you were hurt by something somebody said about you. And it hurt very, very deeply. But as a child, you didn't know how to grieve in a healthy way. So you just pushed it down. You just stuffed it down. But let me tell you, you need to go back and grieve over that hurt you experienced. Why? Because if you don't grieve the losses of life, you get stuck at that stage in your life. You can be 30, 40 years of age physically, but emotionally, you can still be that little 10-year-old child who's still hurting and grieving in your life. Now, when dealing with the grief and we need loss, we need to take the time to express our grief, but then we need to take time to also process through our grief. I've included in the study guide the stages of grief, the seven stages of grief, shock and denial, pain and guilt, anger and bargaining, depression, reflection, loneliness, the upward turn, reconstruction and working through, and then acceptance and hope. If you've experienced some big loss in your life, you need to get help with working through the stages of of grief in your life. If you're stuck in your grief, or if you're hurt or sad or depressed or angry because of the loss of your experience, you might need to seek out help from our counselors at our Celebration Hope Center or help from one of our pastors here at Celebration Church because you're not going to you're not going to be able to overcome depression, anxiety and worry and fear and hurt and sadness until you learn how to process through the grief experiences of your life. But when you're able to process through that grief, that's not only when the Lord brings joy and peace to your life, but He enables you to help others in their life. Yeah. You know, here at Celebration Church, we have people who have gone through the trauma and grief of divorce. 
who are now helping others go through the trauma and grief and divorce. We have people who have overcome some addiction in their life, but now they're helping others overcome some kind of addiction in their lives. We have people who've experienced trouble in their marriage, a lot of sorrow there, but now they're helping others uh, how to overcome sorrow and grief and troubles in their marriage. We have people who have overcome some kind of sexual hurt or dysfunction, but now they're helping others. Here's what I want you to know. God can take every tragedy we ever experienced and turn it around and use it for our good and for others' good, but that'll never happen until we acknowledge the loss and sorrows of our lives. So surviving grief and loss requires acknowledging loss in life. Here's the second thing. Surviving grief and loss requires staying connected to godly people. The Bible says on the way back to Bethlehem, Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back to your mother's homes and may the Lord reward you for your kindness to your husbands and to me. May the Lord bless you with the security of another marriage. And she kissed them goodbye, but they said, no, we want to go with you to your people. Now we focus so far on Naomi's loss and grief with her husband and her two sons passing away. But these two young women, Orpah and Ruth, had experienced much loss and grief as well. They lost the husbands they had come to love at a young age. They, uh, along with the death of their husbands, they had lost the breadwinner of the home for the foreseeable future. They had lost the opportunity to have children. That These two women were grieving as well. So they did what everyone should do when they're going through some kind of grief and loss. They tried to stay as closely connected as they could to the godliest person they knew who was this woman, Naomi. They were even willing to leave their home country of Moab and, 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 and their family and friends to go with her as they journeyed back to Bethlehem. Their story and their focuses remind us that we always need to have good and godly people around us in our lives, all the time in our lives, but especially when we're going through grief and loss in our lives. So do you have people like that in your life? Are you, are you a part of a life group? Uh, do you have uh, some godly Christian mentors in your life? Do you have people that you're close to, people that you can turn to, people that you trust, people that you can talk with? Yeah, listen, grief and loss are always going to be a part of our lives. And because of that, you need to understand God never intended for us to deal with our struggles and troubles all by ourselves. In fact, the Bible says in Galatians 6 two, share each other's burdens. And in this way, you will obey the law of Christ. Now, this goes against the grain for many people. It is a human tendency when we're hurt. When we've experienced a great loss, to, to retreat, to build a shell around us, to not let people know what we're going through. We want to, uh, we, that's exactly the opposite of what we need to do. When we're going through a season of loss, we not only need the support of other people, but by the way, we need the perspective of other people as well. Yeah. When you're in a season of loss, you don't see the whole picture. Your pain narrows your focus, and, and, you need, and you need other people around you to help you see the big picture or the bigger picture. We need each other in all kinds of ways and during a season of loss. In fact, the Bible says the church is to be our spiritual family and primary source of emotional support. It says in Romans chapter 12, In Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. So be devoted to each other like a loving family. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. You see, we're to be a family. We're to care for one another. That's why I'm telling you, if you've never experienced grief and loss in your life, this is a preventative sermon for you. Get involved in a life group now. Get involved. Uh, join the church now. Uh, get involved in a ministry now so you can be connected with other people. So when that time does come, you'll have a support network around you that will help you survive and even uh, thrive through the difficult, challenging, hurtful times of your life. Here's the third thing. Surviving grief and loss also requires understanding our lives still have purpose. Now we're told in our text, and Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back to your mother's homes, and may the Lord reward you for your kindness to your husbands and me, and may the Lord bless you with the security of another marriage. And so Orpah decided to do that. But Ruth decided no matter what, she was going to continue to stay with Naomi to help her and to look after her. In response to Naomi's instructions, Ruth said, Don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people. Yeah. Ruth understood that even though she had suffered great losses herself, she had lost her husband. She understood that her life still had purpose. Now, she didn't know that she would marry again. She didn't know that one day she would be an ancestor of King David, an ancestor of Jesus Christ herself, but she understood that God still had some purpose for her in her life. There were some things God wanted her to do. Now think about this. We have the story of Ruth in our Bible because Ruth understood in the midst of her own grief and sorrow that God still had great purposes and plans for her life. So let me ask you, those of you who have suffered much grief and loss in your life, do you understand that your life still has purpose. Do you understand that the Lord still has purposes and plans for your life? That He wants to use you and what you've experienced to make a difference for good and for God in the world around you. 
One of my favorite passages of Scripture is 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, where Paul writes, God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. Somebody can say praise the Lord right there. Lord. And then he goes on to say, God comforts us in all of our troubles so that, we, so that we can comfort others. When others are troubled, we will then be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. Now listen to me carefully. God never wastes a hurt that we've experienced in our lives. God never wastes a hurt. But we oftentimes waste our hurt because we're not willing to use what we've been through to help other people. See, God uses our pain and our hurt to help others. Who can better help the mother uh, of a special needs child than a mother who's already had a special needs child? Uh, Who can better help somebody uh, whose child struggles with an addiction than, than, than a parent who's already had a child that struggles with an addiction? Who can better help somebody who's been through, who's going through a divorce and somebody who's already been through a divorce? Who can better help somebody who's, who's struggled through the pain of an addiction or a marriage failure or molestation or any of the other evils than somebody else who's already been through that? Listen, God uses the pain we're going through to enable us to better help others. And oftentimes I've discovered our greatest ministries will come from our greatest difficulties or tragedies that we experience in our lives. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, comfort each other and give each other strength. Now I think most Christians want to do that, but sometimes we mess up in doing that. So let me give you five quick tips on how to do that. Number one, you got to be aware. You got to be aware of what people are going through. You got to take note of, of what people are experiencing. You got to, and when people have a, a, doubt, a, a cloudy look on their face or something, you got to be aware of people. Number two, you have to reach out to others with love and care. In other words, don't reach out to others with a judgmental or critical spirit or I, I'm stronger than you attitude. Number three, never minimize another person's pain. Sometimes Christians will say to somebody, I, I know you've uh, suffered a lot, but, but, but at least don't take those words out of your vocabulary. Don't minimize other people's pain. Four, allow people to grieve what they're going through. Don't rush people. Pain, uh, surviving pain and grief take time. And number five, continue being there for those who are hurting. Don't just reach out to them in the first week of their loss or the second week of their loss, but, but stay connected with them on a weekly basis for a long period of time uh, through the next year, if possible, keep being there for people. Let me just say this. Every day of our lives, we should be either seeking comfort from the Lord and from others, or sharing comfort with others every day of our lives. Here's the fourth thing. Surviving grief and loss requires fighting off bitterness in our hearts. Fighting off bitterness. Back in Ruth 1, uh, Ruth said to Orpah and Ruth, uh, back in Ruth 1, Naomi said to Orpah and Ruth, things are far more bitter for me than for you because the Lord himself has raised his fist against me. Obviously and understandably, Naomi was struggling with hurt and grief and bitterness in her life, even bitterness toward the Lord. And then she goes on to, to Bethlehem, and when she arrives in Bethlehem, look at what she says. When they came to Bethlehem, the entire town was excited by their arrival. Is it really Naomi? The women asked. Don't call me Naomi, she responded. Instead, call me Mara. In the Hebrew language, that means bitter. Instead, call me Mara, for the Almighty has made life very bitter for me. I went away full. But the Lord has brought me home empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has caused me to suffer and the Almighty has sent such tragedy upon me? Now again, Naomi was struggling with a lot of hurt, a lot of sorrow. She was blaming it on the Lord. Again, we oftentimes do that. We blame God when it's the devil who's come to steal and kill and destroy. He's the author of death, not the Lord. All the, but, but if we're not careful, we can all struggle with bitterness in our life. Let me tell you, bitterness is a toxic emotion that devastates people and devastates people around them. One time a couple was on their way from New Orleans to uh, Memphis, Tennessee. They were going up I-55 there and, and they stopped in Jackson, Mississippi to gas up their car. And so while the husband was gassing up the car, the wife went into the convenience store and to the restroom. When she came out, she saw the husband conversing with a man like they were old friends. And so they got back in the car, started driving again up I-55. And she said to her husband, you talk like you knew that man, but I've never met him before. He said, uh, you know, he used to live in New Orleans where we live. And he said, when he lived in New Orleans, he lived beside the most bitter mean person in all of New Orleans. I didn't even know he knew your sister. <laughs> People are bitter, mean. Everybody knows who they are. By the way, every mean person you know, every bitter person you know, are like that because they've been through some great loss, some great sorrow in their life. But it's a toxic emotion. It says in Hebrews 12, watch out that no bitterness takes foot among you, uh, root among you. It causes deep trouble, hurting many in their spiritual lives. See, troubles, again, will make us bitter or they'll make us better. 
We are prone to blame other people and God for the problems and losses we've experienced in our lives. Like I said in the beginning, not everything that happens is God's will. It's never God's will for innocent people to be hurt or harmed in any way. It's never God's will for children to grow up without a father or mother or for people to lose their spouse at an early age. It's never God's will for parents to, to lose their children to death. That's what the great man Job experienced. Remember, he, all of his children were killed. And the Bible says, in all of this, Job did not sin by blaming God. So when we're struggling with bitterness, we need to focus on the good we've experienced more so than the bad we've experienced. Job's wife said to him, are you still trying to maintain your integrity? Curse God and die. Man, what a help she was to Job, right? <laughs> she said, curse God and die. But Job replied, you talk like a foolish woman. Should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never receive anything bad? Listen, when you do experience difficulties in life, don't focus on the difficulties. Focus on the good uh, as well as or even more so than the bad. Count up your blessings. They used to sing about that. Count your blessings. And here's what you'll discover. You probably experience far more blessings than losses and hurts and difficulties in your life. And then when we're struggling with bitterness, we need to focus on who and what's left rather than who and what's lost. You know, oftentimes when parents lose a child, you know what happens? They go through a divorce. And because they're so focused on the one that they lost and they're so focused on their self-hurt, they can't, they can't be there for one another. Don't focus on who and what's lost. Focus on who and what's left behind. And remember this, the Bible says in 1 Peter 1, there's wonderful joy ahead. Even though you must endure many trials for a while, while these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Here's the fifth thing. Surviving gr grief and loss also requires deepening our relationship with the Lord. Let's go back to one verse in Ruth chapter 1, verse 16. When Naomi instructs Orpah and Ruth to go back to Moab, to go back to their people, Ruth responds by saying, Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Now remember, Ruth was from where? She was from Moab. And the Moabites inhabited the highlands on the eastern shore of the Dead Sea. Their chief god was named Chemosh, and oftentimes sacrifices, human sacrifices were made to their god Chemosh. What I'm telling you is that Ruth was a, she was a, a pagan woman who was from a pagan nation that, that had all kind of terrible things, but in her sorrow and grief, she saw something in Naomi and Naomi's God that she wanted. Mm -hmm. And she was willing to dedicate herself to that God. Mm -hmm. Listen, we should similarly want to deepen our relationship with Naomi's God and our God, especially when we go through great losses and grief in our lives. Let me tell you something. God, the Bible says, our God, our Lord, He is a wonderful counselor. He is a mighty God. He's an everlasting Father. He's a Prince of Peace. But you don't learn those great truths on the top of the mountain when everything's going well. You learn those truths in the valley when you're struggling with difficulty and loss and grief in your life. Let me tell you something else. While tragedies are a part of life, the Lord has promised He'll bring good out of even the most difficult circumstances we experience in our lives. It says in Romans 8, 28, We know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. And to really believe that God can turn around our greatest tragedies and bring good out of them, we've got to, we've got to strengthen ourselves in the Lord. Now I tell people that Vicki and I, we're the most blessed couple on the planet. But the truth of the matter is, we've experienced a lot of grief and loss and hurt in our lives. You know, my father died at an early age. Vicky's brother uh, was killed in a tragic accident when he was 40 years of age. Her other brother died at an early age as well. Uh, her, her parents died earlier than they should have been. Her mother was uh, immobilized from the waist down for the last four and a half years of her life. Uh, one of our pastors, John Garrett, died at 40 years of age. One of our other pastors, Claude Williams, died. I mean, and we've had so many people die. I mean, we know what grief and tragedy. This, this past week, uh, 20, one of our 29-year-old nephews died of a drug overdose because uh, we know what grief and loss are all about. But here's what we've discovered. When, when those kind of tragedies occur, you have to know how to strengthen yourself in the Lord. I got that phrase from, remember David's story? And the Amalekites and all that kind of stuff. When they wept and they couldn't weep anymore, the Bible says, but David found strength in the Lord his God. And in times of tragedy, in times of sorrow, you've got to know how to dig in with the Lord. You've got to know how to deepen that relationship with the Lord. You've got to know how to seek the Lord's presence and seek the Lord's peace and seek the Lord's power and get help from the Lord. During our grief and time of sorrow, we've got to remember who God is to us, what God's done for us, what He's promised to us, how He can help us. It says in Isaiah, God has sent me to comfort all who mourn, to give to those who mourn in Zion joy and gladness instead of grief and a song of praise instead of sorrow. Only God can take our sorrow and our sadness and turn it into gladness. Now, this has been a difficult sermon for people because 
man, we still it brings to our memory the hurts and the losses and the sorrows we've experienced in life. But it's also helped prepare us for the future losses and sorrows that will come. Let me give you a few other insights in closing. Number one, when we experience grief and loss, we can know that the Lord understands our grief. It says in Isaiah 53, the Lord was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. Think about this, Jesus. Think about how Jesus grieved when his friend Lazarus died. Think about how Jesus grieved over the rejection of the people of his day. Think about the grief he went through on the cross. The Lord understands our grief and sorrow. We also know that the Lord will be there to help us. It says in Psalm 34, verse 18, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and He saves those whose spirits have been crushed. Somebody ought to say praise the Lord right there. Now I have here, uh, this is something I've had in my office for 30 years. It's a poem called Footprints in the Sand. Anybody ever saw that poem before, read that poem before, heard that poem before? It's a story of a man who had a dream, and in his dream he was walking along with the Lord. They were walking along a sandy beach, and he saw the different stages of his life as they walked along the sandy beach, and, and throughout almost all of those stages there was two set of footprints, one representing himself and one representing the Lord. But then he noticed in his dream that in the most difficult times of his life, in the times of grief and sorrow, there was only one set of footprints. And so he cried out to the Lord in his dream. He said, Lord, I thought you said you would never leave me nor forsake me, but I've noticed in the, in the, in the most difficult times of life, there's only one set of footprints. Why did you abandon me when I needed you the most? And the Lord said, my child, you know I love you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I've walked with you throughout all of life, but in the most difficult times of life, there's only one set of footprints because at those times I've carried you upon my shoulders. I mean, that's what the Lord does for the people who know Him and the people who trust Him and the people who love Him. He walks with us and, and carries us upon His shoulders. And then when we experience grief and loss, we can know that we have the hope of seeing our Christian loved ones again in heaven. You know, some of the first century Christians were struggling with grief and sorrow because of family members and friends who had suffered untimely and often unjust deaths. And so Paul wrote these words. He said, we don't want you to be ignorant about believers who have died. We don't want you to grieve like the people who have no hope. And he went on to share how about when Christians die, they go to heaven. Their soul and their spirit goes to heaven and they will return with the Lord Jesus when He returns at the end of time. You see, some of you have godly parents and siblings or friends. You've had them leave this life and go to the next life. Let me tell you the good news. You'll get to see them again in heaven. And you won't just have 10, 20, 50, 60 years. You'll have millions and billions and gazillion years to spend with them in eternity in heaven. Some of you may have lost a precious child to an illness or an injury. You'll get to see them again in heaven. After the death of his infant son, King David said to his advisors, I can't bring him back, but I can go to him. You can see your loved ones like that again in heaven. I often say to people who've lost loved ones to death, Christian people who lost loved ones to death, you've not really lost them. To lose something means you don't know where it is. You know where they are. And you know because you know Jesus, you can see them again sometime in the future. Now people ask me, will I get to see my friends and family in heaven? And the answer is you will definitely get to see your friends and family in heaven if you are a Christian and if they were a Christian. If you are a Christian and if they are a Christian. Now listen, this sermon is going to be a difficult sermon for lots of people. But it's a sermon everybody needs. One, because they've already been through lots of loss and lots of grief in their life. Or two, because they will through, go through lots of loss and grief. Let me tell you, download these sermon notes. Keep them handy because there's going to be a time when you're going to know, need to know how to work through your grief and work through your losses like Ruth and Naomi had to do. And here's a promise from the Lord. Jesus said in the Beatitudes, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Do you want the comfort of the Lord? you got to learn how to mourn. If you don't mourn, you don't get His comfort. If you'll learn how to mourn and grieve and process through your losses, you'll have the comfort and the peace and the help of the Lord in your life. You know, when I was that little five-year-old boy and my aunt died, uh, my uncle would then take me with him to different places in town. And in our little town, they had a blacksmith shop. Yeah, I know you don't know what a blacksmith shop is. You can watch them in westerns. But a blacksmith was somebody who worked with iron and they worked with leather. And, and they could mend any kind of thing. Uh, our blacksmith in our town, he was a big john of a man, big red beard. His name was Rusty. <laughs> I remember Rusty. Boy, he was scary and intimidating. On the wall of his blacksmith shop, he had this sign. Five-year-old boy. I remember these words. Here's what it said. We can mend anything but the break of day and a broken heart. We can mend anything but the break of day and a broken heart. But I'm here to tell you today, I know somebody 
who can mend a broken heart. Amen. His name is Jesus Christ, God's Son. And if you'll surrender your life to Him, if you'll surrender your problems to Him, if you'll surrender your grief and losses to Him, He can mend your broken life, He can mend your broken heart, and He can bring he can bring joy and strength and purpose out of the worst things you've ever experienced in your life. In fact, I want you to bow your head with me right now. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And I want you to think about the great losses and sorrows you've experienced in your life. You might want to ask the Lord to bring them to your attention. And as you do, as the Holy Spirit does, just give them over to the Lord. Say, Lord, I never grieved this loss. I've never got over this loss. I've never gotten healed from this loss. Just go ahead and just bring those things up to the Lord and then ask the Lord to help heal you of the great sorrows and losses you've experienced in your life. And if you're a Christian, I'm telling you, the Spirit of God will come alongside of you and He'll help you process through those griefs and losses that you've never dealt with so you can find new joy and new purpose in your life. Now, you don't have the help of the Lord unless you are a follower of Jesus Christ. And you're not a follower of Jesus Christ till you pray to make Jesus Christ the Savior and Lord of your life. So let me ask you, have you done that? Have you committed your life to Jesus Christ? Have you been born again? Have you made Jesus the King and Lord of your life? If you're not sure that you have, or if you need to recommit your life to the Lord, I want you to pray with me right now. You say, what do I pray for? Pray these words. Let me then pray, Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God and the Savior of the world. Today I'm asking you to come into my life to forgive me of my sins and to begin the process of transforming my life. Take away my shame and my guilt, my hurt and my pain and fill my life with your presence, your peace, your love, your joy, with the power to change and the power to overcome the strongholds of grief and loss in my life. In the name of Jesus I pray, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer and you really meant it, to commit your life to the Lord or recommit your life to the Lord, I want you to go to webcc.info and download that and, and check off, I pray with the pastor or I want to recommit my life to the Lord. I have to do that on a regular basis. Here's something else I want everybody else to do. I want you to go to webcc.info and go to the prayer request section. And I want you to think about somebody you know. Somebody you know who's experiencing right now some kind of grief and loss. It may be the loss of a parent or the loss of a friend or the loss of a spouse through death as well as divorce. It may be the loss of a child. It may be the loss of a job or the loss of a career. It may be the loss of innocence. But if you really care about people, go, uh, go to webcc.info to the prayer request section and write in there, type in there the names of people you know who are experiencing great loss. If you can, why, why they're experiencing great loss, and we will join you in praying for them. And know this, we're going to be praying that God will come alongside of them and be a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, an everlasting Father, and a Prince of Peace to them as well. In fact, let's pray for those that are on your heart right now. Lord, thank you for all those who have joined us for this online service. God, thank you for the opportunity to learn from the stories of Naomi and Ruth how to grieve our losses and our sorrows in healthy ways. But Lord, help us to also care about others who are struggling with great grief and loss in their life. Help us to pray for them and reach out to them, encourage them, minister to them in the ways that we learn today. And Lord, help us to be ambassadors and ministers of healing to the people around us. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, we're so grateful that you joined us today and we hope that the service inspired and challenged you at the same time. If you'd like to request prayer, please let us know by going to webcc.info and clicking on the prayer request tab. The Lord cares about you and we care about you as well. Filling out a prayer request is gonna help our pastors and staff know exactly how to pray for you and your family. If you want more information about us, please visit celebrationchurch.org or one of our social media channels. Once again, thank you so much for joining us at Celebration Church where God has met, love is felt, and lives are changed.